Hiya four, I'm going to be reading you some of The Wild Robot, which obviously we started in school. So I just wanted to give you a quick recap of what happened from the very beginning. Roz washed up um, by, the, by the bottom of the cliff. Um, if you remember, the otters were really interested in what was in the box. And then the robot hatched out of the box and started climbing up the mountain. Uh, she got herself into a forest and if you remember we did a, a description of what she could see when she was climbing the mountain and she was absolutely fine climbing that mountain until a pine cone hit her on the head. So eventually she got to the top of the mountain and she found a clearing and she thought right this will be safe I'm going to stay here. I wonder if anyone remembers what happens then. There was a huge storm and it washed Roz away. The thunder and lightning and the, the river of mud washed her away and she had to cling on for dear life. So she looked for a cave. She went and found a cave, but in the cave there were some bears which chased her away. So she escaped from those bears and she decided, after seeing an insect camouflage itself against a, a little twig, she decided to be a camouflaged robot and what she did while she was there is she learned all the different languages of all the different animals and she started picking up on what everybody was saying she then got discovered by one of the other animals and they were really scared of her they thought she was there to hurt them and it wasn't until the little fox hurt himself and Ros was the only one available to help get the porcupine's prickles out of his face. But they started to think, actually, he might, she might be a nice robot. But then she started climbing a different cliff. And if you remember, she fell and she landed on a family of geese and the eggs just shattered everywhere. And then she ended up with one of the little baby um, Goose, geese, that cracked from the egg. So I am going to read you from that point because that's as far as we got. So she's currently got an egg, a goose egg, from all the geese that she managed to crack. Up in the sprawling oak, the goose egg was peeping and wobbling around its nest. Mama, mama, said the egg. I am not your mother, said the robot. The egg continued peeping and wobbling until nightfall when the gosling inside settled down to sleep and the egg became quiet and still. The robot was about to settle into her own kind of sleep when she heard something in the underbrush below. Rose peered down from the branches and saw weeds rustling in the moonlight. A creature was crawling past, but the creature stayed low, hiding in the darkest shadows so that Rose couldn't see who it was. Rose wasn't the only one watching. A pair of furry ears rose up behind a log. The ears belonged to a very hungry badger. He lay in wait as the shadowy creature came closer and closer. And when the time was right, the badger pounced. You might expect a creature under attack to run for her life or to defend herself, or at the very least to scream. But when the badger pounced, the creature just rolled onto her back, stuck out her tongue and died. Not only was she dead, she was rotten, and the badger's face twisted with disgust. With disgust. Blech, what a stench! He poured at the stinky corpse a few times and then gave up. No thanks, he grumbled to himself. I'd rather eat beetles. And the badger hurried off to find a less disgusting meal. Had that mysterious creature been frightened to death? And how could her body possibly rot so quickly? Bros was confused. And the robot became considerably more confused an hour later when the dead creature's ears began to flicker. Her nose began to twitch and she rolled onto her feet and went on her way as if nothing had happened. The robot's voice called down from the tree. Are you alive or dead? The creature's voice hissed up from the shadows. Who's there? Why have you been watching me? What you just did was unbelievable, said Roz. I could not look away. Unbelievable? Really? The creature's voice seemed to be softening. I thought perhaps I overdid it when I stuck out my tongue. I was certain you were dead. Oh, what a lovely thing to say. 
Well, are you dead? Well, of course not. Nobody can actually come back from the dead. It was just an act. I don't understand. It's simple. I knew that if I played dead and really laid it on thick, that old badger would be so disgusted that he'd run off. And that's exactly what happened. We opossums are natural performers, you know. So you are an opossum. Roz's computer brain quickly retrieved any information it had on opossums. You are a marsupial and are nocturnal and are known for mimicking the appearance and smell of dead animals when threatened. It's true. Death scenes are my specialty, said the opossum, but I have a wide dramatic range, believe me. I believe you. Have you done any acting, said the opossum. I have not, said the robot. Well, you should. You might enjoy it. You can start by imagining the character you'd like to be. How do they move and speak? What are their hopes and fears? How do others react to them? Only when you truly understand a character can you become that character. The two odd creatures sat there, one in a tree, the other in the weeds, and talked about acting. The opossum went on and on about her various acting methods and her triumphant performances, and our robot absorbed every single word. But why do you pretend to be something you're not, said the robot. Because it's fun, said the opossum, and because it helps me survive, as you just saw. You never know it, it might help you to survive too. Soon the robot's computer brain was humming with activity. Performing could be a survival strategy. If the opossum could pretend to be dead, the robot could pretend to be alive. She could add, act less robotic and more natural. And if she could pretend to be friendly, she might make some friends and they might help her live longer and better. Yes, this was an excellent plan. Ros wasted no time and spoke her next words in the friendliest voice she could muster. Madam Marsupial, it would be great to honour and privilege if you could kindly inform me of your name. Ros's friendly demeanour needed some work, but it was a start. Yes, of course, said the opossum. My name is Pinktail, and you are? Leaves gently shook as Ros climbed down from the tree. It is a very lovely pleasure to make your acquaintance, my dear Pinktail. A moment later, the robot stepped into the moonlight. My name is Roz. Oh my, the opossum gasped. You're the m m monster I'm not a monster. I am a robot and I am, I am harmless. Harmless? Really? Well, you do seem rather gentle. And I heard someone say you don't eat any food at all, which makes no sense. But hopefully it means you won't eat me. I won't eat you, said the robot. I'm so glad to hear that, said the opossum. And a moment later, she too stepped into the moonlight. It's nice to meet you, Roz. A weak smile appeared on Pinktail's pointy face. Roz thought things were going really well, but she didn't know what to say next. Neither did Pinktail. So the two friendly creatures just stood there together and listened to the crickets for a while. Well, I should be on my way, said Pinktail at last. Have a nice evening, Roz. Have the nicest evening, Pinktail. I shall look forward to the pleasure of encountering you again in the future. Soon, I hope. Farewell. With that awkward goodbye, Pinktail slipped back into the weeds and Roz climbed back into the tree. The gosling. Something was happening inside the goose egg. Tap, 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 crunch. A tiny bill poked through the eggshell, peeped once and then continued crunching away. The hole grew bigger and bigger and then, like a robot breaking from a crate, the hatchling pulled itself out into the world. He lay quietly in his nest with his eyes closed, surrounded by chips of broken shell. And when his eyes slowly winked open, the very first thing he saw was the robot looking back. Mama, Mama, peeped the gosling. I am not your mother, said the robot. Mama. Mama, I am not your, your mother. Food, food. The gosling was hungry. Of course he was. So, using her friendliest voice, Ross said, What would you like to eat, little darling? Food, was the only response. The hatchling was far too young to be helpful. Ross needed to find a grown goose. So she scooped up the nest with the gosling inside, placed it on her flat shoulder and marched through the forest searching for geese. There's the gosling. The old goose. Ordinarily, the forest animals would have run away from the monster, but they were awfully curious why she was carrying a hatchling on her shoulder. 
and once Roz explained the situation, the animals actually tried to help. A frog pointed Roz up to the squirrels. A squirrel recommended, recommended that she speak with the magpies, and then a magpie sent them over to the beaver pond. The ground grew soggier, the grass grew taller, and soon the robot and the gosling were looking across a wide, murky pond. Dragonflies buzzed through the reeds. Turtles sunned themselves on a log. Schools of small fish gathered in the shadows, and there, floating in the centre of the pond, was an old grey goose. A very good morning to you, the robot's friendly voice boomed over the water. I have an adorable little gosling with me. The goose just stared. I am in great need of your assistance, said Ros. Actually, the gosling is in need of your assistance. The goose didn't move. Food, peeped the gosling. Food, food. That tiny voice was more than the old goose could bear. And she began gliding across the pond and squawking to the robot. What are you doing with that hungry hatchling? Where are his parents? There was a terrible accident, said Ros. It was my fault. The gosling is the only survivor. If there was a terrible accident, why does your voice sound so cheerful? The goose flapped her wings. Are you sure you didn't eat his parents? I am sure I did not eat his parents, said Ros, returning to her normal voice. I do not eat anything, including parents. The goose squinted at the robot. Then she said, do you know who his parents were? I do not know. Well, they must have belonged to one of the other flocks on the island because nobody in my flock is missing. Will you take the gosling? I most certainly will not, squawked the goose. I can't take in every orphan I see. You say this is your fault? It seems to me that it's up to you to make things right. Mamma, mamma, peeped the gosling. I have tried to tell him that I am not his mother, said the robot, but he doesn't understand. Well, you'll have to act like his mother if you want him to survive. There was that word again, act. Very slowly, the robot was learning to act friendly. Maybe she could learn to act motherly as well. You do want him to survive, don't you, said the goose. Yes, I do want him to survive, said the robot, but I don't know how to act like his mother. Oh, it's nothing. You just have to provide the gosling with food and water and shelter. Make him feel loved, but don't pamper him too much. Keep him away from danger and make sure he learns to walk and talk and swim and fly and get along with others and look after himself. And that's really all there is to motherhood. The robot just stared. Mama, food, said the gosling. Now would probably be a good time to feed your son, said the goose. Yes, of course, said the robot. What should I feed him? Give him some mashed up grass and if a few insects get in there, all the better. Ros tore several blades of grass from the ground. She mashed them into a ball and dropped the ball into the nest. The gosling shook his tail feathers and chewed his very first bites of food. By the way, my name is Loudwing said the goose. Everyone already knows your name, Roz, but what's the gosling's name? I don't know. The robot looked at her adopted son. What is your name, gosling? He can't name himself, squawked Loudwing. And then, with a loud burst of wing beats, the goose fluttered up from the pond and landed right on Roz's head. Water streamed down the robot's dusty body as Loudwing leaned over the nest. Oh dear, he certainly is a tiny little thing, said Loudwing. He must be the runt. I'll warn you, Roz, runts usually don't last very long. And with you for a mother, it'll take a miracle for him to survive. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. However, the gosling still deserves a name. Let's see here. His bill is an unusually bright colour. It's actually quite lovely. If I were his mother, I'd call him Bright Bill. But you're his mother, so it's up to you. His name will be Bright Bill said Roz as the goose fluttered back to the water, and we will live by this pond where he can be around mother geese. I will find us a sturdy tree nearby. You will do no such thing, the goose flapped her wings. A tree is no place for a gosling. Brightbill needs to live on the ground like a normal goose. Loudwing sized up the robot. I suppose you two will need a rather large home. You'd better speak with Mr Beaver. He can build anything. He's a little gruff at times, but if you're extra friendly, I'm sure he'll help you out. And if he gives you trouble, remind him that he owes me a favour. The beavers. Every day the beavers swam along their dam, inspecting and repairing it. The wall of wood and mud allowed only a trickle of water to pass through, and it had turned a narrow stream into the wide pond that many animals now called home. As Ros and Brightbill walked around the pond, they passed hundreds of chewed up tree stumps, 
proof that the beavers needed a constant supply of wood. And this gave Roz an idea. The robot swung her flattened hand and the sounds of chopping wood echoed across the water. They were soon replaced by the sounds of footsteps and shaking leaves as the robot carefully walked along the beaver dam with a gosling on her shoulder and freshly cut tree in her hands. The beavers floated beside their lodge and stared at the bizarre sight with open mouths until Mr Beaver slapped his broad tail on the water, which meant stop right there. The robot stopped. Hello beavers, my name is Froz and this is Brightbill. Please do not be frightened, I'm not dangerous. She held out the tree. I've brought you a gift. I thought perhaps you could use this in your beautiful dam. No thanks, said Mr Beaver. I have a strict policy never to accept gifts from monsters. Don't be ridiculous, interrupted Mrs Beaver. We can't let a perfectly good birch go to waste. I'm afraid I must insist, said Mr Beaver. Mrs Beaver turned to her husband. Remember how you asked me to point out when you're being stubborn and rude? Well, you're being stubborn and rude. Then she turned back to Ros. Thank you, monster. If you'd be so kind as to drop the tree in the water, we'll take it from there. I'm not a monster. Ros tossed the tree like a twig. I'm a robot. The tree smacked against the water and sent the beavers bobbing up and down. Just then, Brightbill started peeping. Mama, hungry. So Ros dropped a ball of grass into the nest. The gosling thinks you're his mother, came a quiet voice. It was Paddler, Mr and Mrs Beaver's son. His real mother is dead, said Ros, so I have adopted him. There was a brief silence. Then Paddler looked up at Ros and said, You're a very good robot to take care of, Bright Bill. Mr Beaver sighed. Yes, yes, that's very good of you, Ros, but I don't understand why any of this has to do with us. My son and I need a home, and Loudwing said you would help us build one. Of course she did. Mr Beaver muttered to himself. Loudwing gets me out of one lousy jam and I spend the rest of my days doing her favours. Mrs Beaver glared at her husband. Sorry, he said, realising he was being stubborn and rude again. Stay right there, Ros. We need to have a family meeting. The three beavers slipped under the water and a moment later their muffled voices could be heard inside the lodge. The robot stood on the dam and patiently waited with her son. Mamma, mamma. Yes, Bright Bill, I am trying to act like a good mother. A ripple and Mr Beaver's head appeared above the water. If you bring us four more trees, good, healthy ones, maybe I'll have time to help you in the gosling. That's wonderful, said the robot. We'll be right back. I've built my fair share of lodges over the years, Mr Beaver stood at the water's edge, but I can't say I've ever built one for a robot and a gosling. So just what exactly do you need? We need a lodge big enough for us both, said Ros. It should be comfortable and safe, and it should be near the pond. How long do you plan on living in this lodge? I do not know. Then we'd better make sure it's strong and sturdy. Mr Beaver stroked his whiskers as he thought. Do you plan on having friends over? The missus loves to entertain. I do not have any friends. No friends? Well, you seem pretty likeable for a monster. I mean a robot. But if you want my advice, you should grow yourself a garden. Your neighbours won't be able to resist French, fresh herbs and berries and flowers. Just you wait and see. So we'll make sure there's plenty for a garden and we'll give you a lodge for some extra space for all your friends that you'll be hosting. The beaver winked. We also need to find a way to keep your lodge comfortable when it's cold outside. Our lodge is heated by our own bodies, but I think we'll have to find another way to heat yours. The beaver and the robot thought about heat for a while. The first thing that came to Rosie's mind was the sun, but then she remembered the hot sparks she'd felt while sliding down the mountain peak. I could heat our lodge with fire, she said. Mr Beaver blinked his eyes. I will need to experiment, Ros continued, but I think there is a way. You go right ahead, Ros, said the beaver, but would you try not to burn down the entire forest? Do not worry, I will be careful. Let's move on, Mr Beaver sighed. The next order of business is to find a site for your lodge. That meadow across the water would be perfect, but the hares will have to ha will have a fit if we try to build there. I think we should just clear out some trees and build right in the forest, and I know just the place. The beaver took them along the water and up to the dense section of forest that jutted into the pond. It needs some work, said Mr Beaver, trudging through the thick weeds, but this ought to do the job. Yes, said Ros in her friendliest voice. Job, said Bright Bill. 
Mr. Beaver was incredibly skilled at taking down trees, but even he couldn't help with help keep up with Roz's powerful chopping hands, so he let the robot do the hard work. He pointed out the trees and shrubs that needed to go, and Roz started hacking away. By sunset, they were standing in a newly cleared site, and they had more than enough wood to build the lodge. You did some fine work today, 